I want to thank you all for being here. Um, I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Megan Gullah, and I work at Civic Lex. Um, I'm also an AmeriCorps VISTA in my second term. Um, so I'll be facilitating the conversation today. Um, along with me from Civic Lex is uh, Richard Young, who's the executive director. He'll also be facilitating these conversations um, in the future. And then um, Sarah Trapp, who's doing her master's degree practicum with us um, from UK. Um, so we love having her. She's done so much work for us. Um, she's amazing. Um, as for today, we're going to be talking about food aid and um, community support services. So we'll be talking with Melissa Tibbs from the Community Action Council and Michael Halligan from God's Pantry. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll let them um, introduce themselves and we'll continue the conversation. Hi everyone, my name is Melissa Tibbs. I work for Community Action Council. My title is the Director of Planning, Communication and Advancement. Um, and what that means in my everyday life is that I oversee the grant writing and the communications to the public, um, all the annual reporting and all of those kinds of things that we have to do for funding sources. Um, and in COVID-19 world, I am kind of in charge of all of the communication efforts that go out to, uh, to the public to talk about what new um, services we are providing and kind of how existing services have been modified. So that's been kind of what I've been doing on the day to day for the last several weeks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Melissa. Sure. Michael, how about you? Hey, everybody. I'm Michael Halligan from God's Pantry Food Bank. Uh, I serve as the CEO for the organization. Um, many of you are probably familiar with God's Pantry uh, here in Lexington, as opposed to God's Pantry Food Bank, uh, the broader organization and the work that we do. Uh, God's Pantry started in 1955, a woman by the name of Mim Hunt, who was delivering groceries to those who were impoverished out of the basement of her home. We grew from that humble beginning to serving 50 counties in central and eastern Kentucky as a food bank. Uh, think about us as the warehouse that is providing food to many food pantry and meal programs across central and eastern Kentucky, some 400. Uh, that is by far the core of our work. Uh, we handle over 40 million pounds of food a year. Uh, think about that is 34, 35 million meals worth of food. Uh, a portion of that goes into Fayette County. A much larger portion goes to the other 49 counties that we serve in central and eastern Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very uh, humbled and pleased to be here today. And we'll be happy to answer any questions as we get into the conversation. Thank you all both. Um, or thank you both for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, my first question is from Michael, um, and I wanted to know, I've heard um, from other, just reading about other um, food banks and food pantries, that um, supply has been an issue um, and some places are running low. Um, so I wanted to know, or just wanted to ask, um, where does your supply come from? And then are you seeing um, any changes in that supply chain? Um, how's that going for you? So uh, a couple of things I would share. First, uh, we have an adequate supply of food today. <laughs> to be able to provide all of the services that we provide at the elevated level of need that we're seeing. Um, so today we're in a really good good position from, a, from an inventory perspective. Mm -hmm. Our food comes from three basic sources. Uh, the first is donated product. Those come from retailers, from wholesalers, from manufacturers, mm -hmm. not only in and around uh, Fayette County and across the Commonwealth, but from all over the country. That's about 50%, somewhere between 50 and 60% of the food that we receive and that we gather. Uh, we're seeing some changes in that mix of food, but we're still seeing about the same amount come in overall. For the first couple of weeks, uh, product that we were getting from grocery stores declined. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of you saw this as you went and, and shopped for your own pantries. Uh, a lot of store shelves were bare. Because those store shelves were bare, we were getting less donations from the grocery stores. That's actually started to correct itself, and we're starting to see a more typical flow of donations coming from grocery stores. The mix looks a little different. We're seeing more produce. We're seeing a little bit less of staples, canned goods, and we're seeing far less meat protein. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that as you kind of go through the stores yourself when you see which shelves are more empty and which shelves are more full. The ones that are more empty are the, are the ones that we're getting less of. Mm -hmm. so that's about um, donations in general, uh, about 50 per 60 percent of our volume. About half of that comes from grocery stores, the other half from manufacturers and, and others across the country. Mm -hmm. About a third of our volume comes from the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture, 
through feeding uh, through uh, the Kentucky Department of Ag. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're actually seeing an increase in that volume. Mm -hmm. And that's because uh, part of the COVID-19 response plans that were uh, enacted by Congress, they increased donations from USDA by $300 million across the country. Mm -hmm. We're actually seeing about a 15 to 20 percent increase right now in USDA commodities. Mm -hmm. The last 10 or so percent of the volume that we get, we purchase. Mm -hmm. um, and we've made a commitment to purchase three quarters of a million dollars in the next 30 days to make sure that we've got plenty of food for the increased demands that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. The challenge that we're seeing with that purchase product right now is lead times are very long. Mm -hmm. And that's because grocery stores are bare and the manufacturing sector is trying to replenish those grocery stores mm -hmm. and our orders are second priority mm -hmm. to, to those primary customers yeah. so long answer to your question no, thank you yeah feel pretty good about our inventory mm -hmm. um what we don't know is what it's going to look like a month from now yeah yeah thank you um i'll come back to that in just a yep. moment um i wanted to ask melissa um just if you want to go through like some of the services um, that Community Action Council offers um, and then changes that you're seeing to those because um, I know some have have closed or some of the in-person um, services have changed. So if you want to talk a little bit about that. Sure. And I might take a minute just to kind of give a brief overview of what sure. Community Action Council is and mm -hmm. when it got started. So we actually just a few weeks ago commemorated our 55th anniversary. Um, we were enacted. Um, we started when um, President Johnson signed the War on Poverty, the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964. And so we have been serving in Lexington for 55 years. Um, we are designated by the local government to be um, to, per, to address the causes and conditions of poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and now we, we largely serve uh, Fayette and Bourbon, Harrison and Nicholas counties, but we do have statewide operations for a number of programs. And so in Fayette County, Lexington, what we have are four community centers um, where anyone um, in need can come in and, and seek our services. And so it is uh, through, those service, through those centers that we have largely operated a lot of our programs. One of our largest programs is Head Start, um, which was the first program that we um, had when we first opened our doors. Um, but we also do a variety of other things um, such as emergency assistance for energy, utility bills. Um, we're also doing some youth service work. We work with uh, students who are um, transitioning out of foster care mm -hmm. and into um, you know, adult life. And uh, so we provide a lot of assistance with that with, with respect to their housing, as well as just general um, helping them with making life choices. Mm -hmm. um, and then while we're here today, um, in addition to um, the things that we do, we are um, we operate one of God's Pantry locations um, off of Cambridge Drive in mm -hmm. the Cardinal Valley area of Lexington. Yeah. Um, but to speak to your question about kind of the services that we offer and, and the kind of the ones that we're focusing on right now with COVID. So um, we are closed to the general public, but all of our services have sort of transitioned to a telenetwork mm -hmm. uh, capacity. So right now there's a program um, that you may know of called LIHEAP Crisis, mm -hmm. and it is federal funding um, for households that typically, the way that we operate it was uh, that they would have a disconnect notice mm -hmm. or that they would be within a few days of their bulk fuel. Um, mm -hmm. And so we are piloting a project with some of our partners, um, state partners, to um, be able to not just accept disconnect notices, but also late notices or overdue notices or, or notices from the utility company about the, um, the amount due on the bill um, as a way to help um, you know, reach the, the most amount of um, households. Mm -hmm. So that's all happening um, online um, and through the phone. So um, if any of providers are there, um, are in, in part of this conversation, so you can still reach us through our typical phone number of 233-4600. And then we have those calls being kind of diverted to whichever need is the one being requested. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, we have um, implemented with the assistance of the Coronavirus Response Fund, which I'm sure most people mm -hmm. on the um, call know what that is. But if you don't, it is um, a partnership between Bluegrass Community Foundation, the United Way and the city of Lexington. and um, we applied for some funds or received some funds. And the way that we are using those funds are to meet really urgent needs, especially for families with young children. And so we have set up distribution sites 
um, for baby care and personal care, sort of feminine hygiene care products mm -hmm. um, that we are distributing. And um, we're doing it for those in need. So we're limiting, we are limiting um, the eligibility and kind of all of that stuff that often is a barrier or a hindrance mm -hmm. um, to being able to just get um, the things that people need out to them. Yeah. And so, but we are, we are uh, working uh, to give that, to give those products to our Head Start families and also mm -hmm. community families. Where are those so, distribution centers? I'm sorry, where are they? Mm -hmm. So we have several uh, set up kind of throughout our service area. Mm -hmm. The one here in Fayette County is at 913 Georgetown Street, mm -hmm. which is the facility that we operate one of the community centers in. And we are, um, as I'm sure we'll get into, we are practicing social distancing. So, um, and I believe Megan, you might be sending out some information to those on the call, or I can drop it in the chat mm -hmm. um, if you'd like about the actual information um, about how to call and arrange mm -hmm. for those, because um, that can be distributed to sure anyone in need. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, to, be, to be specific, it's uh, diapers, wipes, formula, and then um, again, the personal care products. Mm -hmm. And um, so people are calling and they're being given an appointment and they're, we're kind of staggering the appointments again mm -hmm. to um, adhere to social distancing. And we are putting it kind of directly into their um, trunk. So there's, mm -hmm. it's like a drive-through model. Um, the other locations that we have just for anyone who might be serving or working with folks in other counties, we have one in um, Nicholas County, Richmond, and Bourbon. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Sure. Uh, and it, we'll come back to um, yeah. talking about like staff and safety and all those things. Um, my next question is um, for, for both of you. Um, and you can just respond on how your organization is, is experiencing it. Um, but I wanted to know how has demand changed? Um, and how many people do you normally serve? Um, and what are your numbers now? Um, we'll throw that to Michael first. So across central and eastern Kentucky, we're seeing about a 35% increase in need. Mm -hmm. uh, it varies from one county to the next. Uh, we are seeing some counties and some of the partner agencies that we work with um, experiencing double the need that they typically see. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's being driven by uh, furloughs, temporary loss of jobs, uh, restaurant industry, hospitality industry are particularly um, notable in uh, in what we're hearing in the in the marketplace and in the media. Mm -hmm. uh, Fayette County, we typically handle about 500 to 550 households a week. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing easily double that in Fayette County. Uh, it's interesting. There seems to be some correlation between the magnitude of uh, positive uh, COVID-19 tests and the increase in demand. Mm -hmm. That may just be um, an anomaly, uh, but there does seem to be some correlation between higher need in counties where there are more, uh, more confirmed cases. And Megan, my answer is very similar, especially um, you know, that we are seeing quite a different, um, quite a, quite, sorry, many more people or households than we typically see. And also because we are trying to be more flexible where we can um, in terms of income eligible guidelines and things like that, we're trying to really um, address the needs of those who may have um, been gainfully employed up until last month, that kind of thing. So recognizing that this may not have been a long-term um, need of theirs, but again, in the short term, we're trying to address things like energy assistance, Medicaid access, and those kinds of things. So um, we're seeing people that might not ever have been to Community Action Council before or knew, you know, who we were. Um, and we're, we're, you know, we're addressing kind of the whole spectrum um, of impact. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to know, it's like, how are you modifying your services? I know we've talked um, some already about like switching to online, um, but how are you modifying your services kind of more specifically to um, to meet demand? And then how sustainable is that? Are those modifications like over the long term? And especially with the, the food bank, um, are you, do you think you'll, I think you, you spoke to this earlier a little bit, but is it sustainable over the long term to provide for um, more clients? I guess, and how are you thinking about the future? So a couple of things that we've done in terms of modifying service, um, historical models have been what we describe as shopping. So an individual who's hungry 
uh, goes to a pantry and they're literally shopping for food off the grocery store shelf, off, off of what looks like a grocery store shelf. So a great example is what we do over in Cardinal Valley on Cambridge Drive with Community Action. There's a pantry there. Uh, we accept referrals um, and appointment times and those who are scheduled to visit the pantry that day will go into the pantry. They will shop the pantry. They'll receive dry goods, fresh produce, uh, meat protein, uh, dairy items, a whole array of different products uh, for their scheduled appointment time. Because of social distancing, we've modified that a little bit. So we're not doing as much shopping today. Uh, in Fayette County, we're not doing any shopping. Uh, instead, what we've done is we've prepared um, food boxes that have what a individual typically selects off of the store shelf, uh, and that's prepackaged. And then we are packaging dairy items, uh, meat protein, those kinds of things in a grocery bag at delivery. And rather than having the individual come inside the pantry, uh, we are meeting them uh, at their car and providing that food at their car. We're also doing uh, mass distributions at times uh, to be able to help us with the magnitude of people that we're managing. If you can, if you can imagine a small parking lot in Cardinal Valley on Cambridge Drive, it's difficult to handle, you know, two or three hundred people. So instead, what we're doing is per periodically we're doing more of a mass distribution at a select location where we know there are households that have great need. We've got a total of three pantries that we are operating. There's one in Cardinal Valley at Community Action. There's a second at St. Luke, and there's a third at Central Christian, all of which are accepting appointments through, um, through our website and through our phone number uh, for folks to come and get food assistance when they need it. And then again, we're doing that larger distribution uh, periodically to make sure that we're handling the larger number of people that we need to support. There are similar activities going on all over central and eastern Kentucky. Um, by and large, most of our 400 uh, food pantry and meal programs have gotten away from shopping. They're doing more curbside service kinds of applications. Um, it's absolutely sustainable as long as we have the food that we need to pack the boxes. So when I talked earlier about the supply chain and our sources of goods, we're monitoring that inventory very closely. Uh, we feel pretty good about where we are with USDA volume. We're a little more concerned about donated volume and our purchased product. Um, we will modify quantities where we need to, to make sure that we're able to provide service to everyone. Uh, the next two to four weeks will be an important time for us as we watch those inventories and make sure that we keep the supply of food coming in so that we can then serve the needs for those who are hungry. So far, it's working well. Um, like I said, we don't know what the future will hold on the supply of food coming in. We're just watching that really close. Mm -hmm. One quick thing. Do you all offer, um, are you delivering food at all? Or what are the options for people who can't uh, make it to those centers? So one of the things that we're doing is we're working with uh, law enforcement, mm -hmm. uh, primarily Fayette County Sheriff's Department, and they have uh, coordinated folks that don't have access to transportation, and they are doing some pickup on behalf of those who can't get to a pantry. We've also got a process where an individual can designate another individual to pick up on their behalf. So when someone calls our phone number and schedules that appointment, um, they will either let us know that another individual will pick up on their behalf so that we can get it to someone who is um, homebound or access to transportation is challenged. One of the reasons why we do all of that is part of what we're distributing is government commodities. And by law, we have to uh, ask at the point of distribution whether or not the individual is qualified. It's self-designated, so we're not asking for a lot of information. And at the end of the day, we're supposed to fill out a log with the, with the name and the signature of each of those people. Um, we're not take, we don't have to take signatures right now. We're able to do an affidavit that basically attests to the fact that, um, that the volunteer has asked those questions of each recipient at the point of distribution. And then they, assign, they attest on the affidavit that then goes to the Kentucky Department of Ag. So we have to have somebody at the site getting the food because there's government commodity in that box. Thank you. Melissa, what kind of modifications have you all 
implemented? Well, I would say, you know, in addition to what Mike said um, specifically, the, what, what we've been able to do is really be able to staff um, the, the, the pantry um, with, because of the higher demand, you know, it takes more people to be able to, um, to meet that need. And so um, while many of our ongoing services have been able to transition, so our staff are working, staff who were working before COVID, um, you know, in that capacity are still continuing to do that. But we do have some positions that didn't necessarily have um, an easy transi transition. And so those staff, many of those staff are um, assisting in our everyday food pantry. So Mike said earlier that um, Cambridge Drive, our pantry location that we operate uh, for, God's, for God's Pantry Food Bank um, operates five days a week. And with the increased demand there, as well as for the pop-ups that Michael was talking about, um, you know, we have been able to staff that through volunteer staff um, who were previously doing other um, functions for community action largely. And then we also have some volunteers as well. So I would say that's probably the largest modification um, in terms of our approach to being able to meet the need, um, which right now has been, um, you know, easy to do because of the, you know, the obvious restrictions of um, being close to the public. I wanted to know too, for both of you, um, what demographic changes you're seeing um, in your client base? Like, how has that changed? Um, I'm kind of doubling up on questions because I had a lot of questions. And I want to make sure we get through all of them. Um, and then, how are just how are your clients feeling? Um, if you're able to, if, if you've talked to them or um, you know your employees, your staff, um, what's the feedback on just how people are feeling about it? Melissa, why don't you go ahead and start on this one? Okay. Um, so I would say it's it's a lot like what we said before that we're seeing. Um, different families than we've seen before um, in some instances. Now, that, again, that's across Community Action Council. Um, uh, yeah, again, families who maybe just recently lost employment and are um, are looking to uh, maybe get some assistance for emergent or for the uh, energy assistance as well as for Medicaid, things like that. So we're seeing people that we haven't typically seen before, and as well as continuing to see um, you know families that we had been working alongside. Um, and in general, the way they're feeling, um, I think they feel much like we all feel. Um, they're, they're, we're getting feelings of uh, being stressed and scared, um, but we're also getting um, people who are expressing their relief and gratitude for when they are able to find um, a resource that meets the need that they're asking us for. Um, so we're seeing, um, you know, and we're, so one of the things that we're doing is that we're doing some in-depth follow-up with families that are coming to us for any service. And so we're able to kind of talk through them a little bit uh, with them a little bit more about kind of how else we may be able to meet their need. Because it's not, un, it's not uncommon for Community Action Council in general. When people come to us, they have a very specific need in mind, especially if there's an emergency going on. Um, and again, outside of COVID-19, that, that had been the case too, where once they come in or they've talked to us on the phone and they're getting the need met, then we can kind of talk with them to figure out if there are other things that maybe they just weren't focused on initially, um, where they can describe to us and explain to us what their needs are that we can try to find either an internal resource of, of the service or program that we're operating or one that we know of um, as a connection. Uh, so that's happening in, in great detail um, over the last several weeks with the staff who are um, informed and resourced um, and being able to provide that very intense case management. Yeah, and I would just kind of echo the comments on in terms of how people are feeling. Um, you know, to Melissa's point, um, we see and hear a lot of very, very grateful people who are, um, you know, thrilled. Thrilled is probably the wrong word. Uh, grateful, you know, to have the support. Um, you know, part of part of what we talk about is fighting hunger and delivering hope. And what we hear from many people is access to food is one less thing for them to worry about. So they can worry about other things that, that they need to manage in their lives and not have to worry about food. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, um, it's very humbling when someone shares a quick story about not having to worry about food uh, and being able to put a meal on the table. It's, it's very, very humbling when we get those stories. We get a lot of them right now. Uh, we don't have uh, any statistics on demographic change. Um, one of the things that's important for people to realize is hunger cuts across the fabric of society. 
There are many people that live one paycheck at a time. Uh, some of those folks are at greater risk of hunger today because of furlough or loss of job. There are folks with unexpected medical expenses. Uh, so imagine a family who unfortunately uh, has someone who has been diagnosed and all of a sudden has a different kind of medical expense that they're trying to deal with in their recovery. They may be hungry and have never been hungry before. Uh, we're seeing a lot of, of households that are hungry for the first time. Uh, but demographically, I don't know that we have any data to say that, that you know, one neighborhood is any different than another neighborhood. It's just an increase in magnitude overall. Thank you um, for answering those questions. Um, we brought up staff just a few minutes ago. Um, I wanted to know, like, how has staffing changed or has staffing changed? And if so, how um, and how are you keeping staff who interact with the public safe? Melissa, well, so you want me to go first on this one? Sure. Yeah, we can <laughs> go for it. Cool. Um, we were actually quite fortunate to be fully staffed just before the pandemic broke um, or emerged is probably a better word. Um, so from a staffing standpoint, we really haven't changed paid staff. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen a pretty big change in our mix of volunteers. Uh, a large percentage of our volunteers are in the age group that's of greater risk, 60 plus. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're being very thoughtful in working with that volunteer base. And we've made some pretty significant changes in the way that we are accessing volunteers, the way that we are working with those volunteers to help us with activity. We've also been very fortunate the last uh, week and a half to have the National Guard on site, uh, Governor Brashear and uh, Feeding Kentucky. Uh, along with the National Guard, uh, we're able to do a two-week deployment. That's helped us with building emergency food boxes. That's helped us with managing orders in our warehouse. Uh, so those are just a couple of things that, that we've done to make sure that we're able to keep up with the increased need and how we've modified our staffing and, and really our volunteers to help us do the work that we need to do. About 50% of our hours over the course of a year are through volunteers, so it's a critically important piece of our overall staffing. Yeah, I'd read um, read a few articles saying like a lot of volunteers um, at sites like yours are senior citizens or like over fifty five, and like within this this risk age risk group. Um, and and reading that volunteers. In a well, you know, Megan, one of the things that's really neat about that is we've had hundreds of volunteers that are sixty plus mm -hmm. who have called us and said we still want to help help us find the right thing that we can do safely. So there's a number of wonderful conversations that have gone on in the midst of all of this unprecedented uncertainty where people's hearts are, are just, they're over the top with trying to figure out the right way to help where they're not putting themselves at risk. Um, and we've done some things with our call-in center to be able to increase the, you know, the calls that we can take. And we're doing that with folks that are working from home, they're healthy at home. We're routing telephones to individuals' homes so that we can do um, our central intake for appointments. Um, and, and that's allowed us to be able to do more appointments to help more people. So there's some really cool creative things that we're doing with the volunteers, uh, many of whom are over 60 and we found ways to help them volunteer without putting them at risk. We have as well, just as an aside, we have um, with the volunteers who are over 55, as you're saying, um, many of them have joined us in making masks that are being distributed um, to uh, service industries that are, um, you know, still providing service. Uh, so that's been a great, and many of them have the skills to do it, right? So we're providing things like fabric and, um, you know, the, the other materials, but they know how to sew and they're happy to help. And so that's been a nice thing for us to be able to, um, you know, as we go through this, to be able to um, find assets and, and you know, sort of understand people and, and that, um, you know, and how they interact differently. Um, it's been a nice plus. We've had a lot of conversations with senior sewers like, yeah, I can sew all day. Just give me the materials and, and we can make it happen. And so that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. How yeah, do you talk afterwards? I could use some masks for our truck drivers. That's one of the changes that we've made. Okay. Our truck drivers are wearing masks to reduce the risk of 
passing the virus to one another. Wonderful. Um, well, so I was going to ask you, like, how have you modified programs like, um, or how do you provide, I guess, still like the services like the Head Start programs and these yeah. like, um, you know, really personal, like intensive services that you offer? How are you able to continue those um, right now? Yeah. So one of the models, one of the good things about Head Start is that they have a lot of different types of models. So um, we, so just for a quick overview, we do. Um, Outside of COVID-19, we um, have direct managed child development centers, but we also have partnerships for community-based child care as well as public school preschool. Um, but one of the other models that we do is home visiting. So we, um, where trained staff will go in with families who are home for whatever reasons with their young children and provide, um, you know, a, uh, in-depth skill uh, development with the families, with their children. And so we've been able to sort of take that model and kind of go virtual with it. Um, and um, as we are providing kits uh, of toys and um, activities and materials and things like that, we're distributing those safely. And then we have um, staff who are coming, um, following up to that and calling families and kind of working with them so that they're still getting skill development. We're doing um, videos that are being shared virtually with families who have the access um, and we're providing, um, you know, again, in-depth phone conversations with those who maybe not don't have access. Um, but a lot of the Head Start work as we know it is continuing. Um, and one of the big things about that is that Head Start is not just about what happens with the child in the classroom, but it's also about what happens with the family. And so the work that we are doing um, to help uh, to help parents help their children, we are also being able to model for them and finding out kind of what, you know, what are their needs right now and um, if employment is one and kind of where they want to go with that and being able to sort of continue to work on their family plan um, just as we would have otherwise. Um, so that's that's a, a lot of virtual um, and tele-network uh, ser services and support are happening um, primarily with all of our participants or, yeah. you know, programs. Are you able to do that? Like, are you able to do that as well with um, some of the adult programs, like um, some of the, like the shelter um, support services and, and like professional development or job training services as well? Yes. Um, for the most part, you know, all of what we've been able to do, we're doing before has been able to move to this sort of digital capacity. Um, and then we're providing additional supports and, and things that um, that maybe weren't in play before. I'm trying to think of um, Come back to me on that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's a lot to talk about. Um, and I wanted to know next, um, who qualifies for um, for services from both God's Pantry and Community Action Council, um, and what do people need to do to access them? Like, what kind of paperwork do they fill out? Um, who do they call? How do they get in touch with you and and get access to the services you're providing? So I can start. So. Um, again, right now, kind of the things that we're really seeing um, an increase in outside of the food um, with God's Pantry is energy assistance with the funding that we have available, as well as um, the need to access health care coverage. Um, and so those um, so with energy assistance, we've been able to modify our application process um, where things can be, um, you know, documentation that we need. We can um, get digitally or we can um, do sort of good faith efforts to get that after the threat of COVID-19 um, lapses. Uh, so we are still able to provide um, the energy assistance application process and completion so that anyone, and again, so the, the important thing there is while we know that utility companies are not, um, they are suspending disconnects during this time, that the, uh, what we want um, families to know is that that doesn't mean that the bill is being waived. And so right now, while there is funding available through a process or a program that was already in place and um, it, it did extend, uh, typically it will end the end of March. And right now it's been extended through the end of April. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so we wanted we want families who might be eligible for that to understand that there, there is funding now, even if um, they haven't received a disconnect notice or if they aren't being disconnected, if they have received one. So that's one of the things that we're um, that we're we're seeing a lot of uh, increased demand for that simply because we are advertising that the funding will eventually expire. Mm -hmm. um, are there other services like um, assistance for rent um, or for people experiencing kind of housing insecurity right now? Um, things they can take advantage of. 
So we're working with community partners on, on rent. Um, I saw a question come through um, in the chat about like what we'd we want from stimulus funding. And so we are working on plans to be able to utilize um, funding that we have and also to leverage our resources with what other uh, partners may be getting. Um, but rent would certainly be uh, something that we're um, wanting to help you know, meet that need because we know that that will be a huge need um, once a moratorium on um, evictions is, passes as well. So that's definitely one that we're looking to be able to source. Um, right now, a lot of what the work of our um, housing programs are doing is aimed at helping people who are experiencing homelessness and um, uh, being able to put them into shelter uh, to, to help them be health, uh, safe and healthy. And so a lot of the efforts that we are doing are, are aimed at that in particular. Mm -hmm meeting that need. So should people, oh, sorry, should people call if they want any information, any more information, or if they want to apply um, for one of these programs, they should just call and they'll be connected. With yeah, the 233-4600 number will get you connected to okay. whomever mm -hmm. is the right fit or program for um, the need that is at least presenting. And again, it's important that community action is really experienced with being able to kind of meet, meet initial needs um, or find out what they are and then help um, a family or an individual sort of explore if there are other resources that they may not even be thinking of um, because they're just kind of in that survival mode. Um, so we definitely want uh, that that initial intake number to be the number because that will help get them connected to a multitude of services if that's what they need. Thank you. Um, Michael, how about you? What do people need to do um, to to get food from the food bank? So the first thing, uh, food for food bank, it depends on whether we're talking Fayette County or whether we're talking outside of Fayette County. Mm -hmm. In the case of Fayette County, uh, call our central intake number, which is 259-2308. Again, that's 259-2308. We've got volunteers answering the phones from nine until noon, and then again from one until three. Uh, the referral process that we use involves social service agencies all over Fayette County. Community Action is one of them. So that whole referral process is still in place. We're also taking direct um, uh, calls from folks that don't necessarily have a referral right now. The pantries are open Monday through Friday from 3 to 5 p.m. to do that curbside distribution that I talked about earlier. Um, so again, call that number. 259-2308 if you're in Fayette County. If you're outside of Fayette County, go to our website, godspantryfoodbank.org, um, click on find help, and then look for the county that, that you live in and click on that county and you will see all of the food pantry and meal programs that are available in the county that you live in. The reason why it's so important to have that referral and have that central intake appointment um, or to get food from the county that you live in is part of what we're doing is we're distributing government commodities. And uh, by law, those commodities need to be distributed to residents of the county. So you really need to be getting your food in the county where you live. Uh, from a guideline standpoint, we're using the, the FDA or the FDA, the USDA uh, guidelines on qualification, which again, is it's self-declared. Um, household that's 185 percent of the poverty level of below automatically uh, is eligible folks that don't have a current source of income are automatically eligible uh, and it's all self-declared um, so it's pretty pretty easy and pretty quick to get the referral and to get the appointment and again uh, it's all self-declared um, are there any wait times for that um, for those intake appointments or just for at the distribution centers are are you seeing that people are having to wait any um, or is it pretty you know, for so as, as far as the appointments are concerned um, we're actually able to schedule most people same day uh, we've got capacity uh, for appointments that exceed the demand that we're seeing most days um, if we run into a situation where we've used up all of the appointments for one day, we actually schedule the current day and two days out. So we can schedule someone for tomorrow if they're not able to pick up today. Um, because we're doing the central intake and because we're getting all of the appointments, we're able to keep the lines pretty short. Um, the wait time is, is very short by and large. One of the things that's kind of interesting though is, is is individuals who are food insecure, who are who are hungry, or who other 
who other who need other sorts of social services support, they're sort of conditioned to be there at the beginning and then to stand in line. So we try to do things to spread it out because everybody's going to get food and everybody's going to get the same food. There's no need for a person to be the first person in line and, and get something different than the last person in line. Um, so we're trying to keep the, the line short as we can. When we do a larger distribution, the line is a little bit longer because we're dealing with more people. Um, it's just kind of an interesting dynamic. By and large, the lines are not very long. Uh, by and large, we're able to serve people pretty quickly. That's good. Um, are there any other resources um, just that you all know of that people should be aware of or um, can visit? For, like for both of your organizations, like food aid and just general support? So one thing I'll throw out uh, is SNAP. Uh, used to be called Food Stamps, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. Uh, individuals that uh, do not have a current source of income uh, are eligible for SNAP. Uh, there is a way for them to apply for SNAP through God's Pantry Food Bank. Uh, you can go to our website to get information on that, godspantryfoodbank.org. There are also a, a number of state offices that take SNAP applications. And there are some waivers in place right now that help uh, individuals who have that need. Um, it's really important for people who, who have a need to recognize that that's an option. Uh, for every meal that a food bank can provide, SNAP generally provides 12. So it's a really uh, important benefit that provides a wonderful bridge for people who are in uncertain times to be able to get a good, uh, sound nutrition, to be able to sustain themselves over that uncertain period of time. So that's one resource I would throw out. Um, Megan, I would say, you know, in addition to um, 211 you know, that is operated by United Way. It's important for anybody here who might also be operating services in other counties that Community Action Council is part of a network um, of community action agencies. So as I mentioned, we got our roots um, back in 1964. And at, at that time, about a thousand community action agencies sprouted up um, across the country. And so there are 23 here in Kentucky and all of Kentucky is covered by a community action agency. And they all kind of do different things uh, depending on the needs of the community. Oh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. oh. There's a little bit of an echo. Oh, I'm sorry. Is, is it better? It sounds good okay. now. It was just like for a second. It might be good. Yeah, you're good. I mostly wanted to let people know that community action um, agencies are, exist all throughout Kentucky. There are 23 and um, each of us might do something a little bit different depending on the general needs of our community. So if anybody's here or um, working outside of Fayette County, um, you'd also want to maybe find the community action agency that covers that area as well um, as just a general resource. Fantastic. Um, I wanted to know too from both of you, um, is there anything Lexingtonians can do to support your work? Um, like, do you need volunteers? Do you need food, um, you know, like food donations? Um, what can Lexington do for your organizations right now? Uh, Yes, we are certainly um, in need of uh, some volunteers. Certainly donations are nice. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, you know, things like I want to kind of just sort of extend that, you know, the generosity of the community at this time is just astounding. And every day there's a new connection or a new um, opportunity um, that leverages work that we're doing. And so I, I want to say, Megan, that you said that Becca Self with Food Chain has been featured previously, but she um, and Food Chain have been providing 150 hot meals um, every day to um, giving to the pantry, which we are then distributing as well, um, along with the, the box food that Michael was talking about. And so it's just such a, um, a nice leverage of, um, of, of, of passion, interest, and the, just the general desire to help people in need. Um, out, you know, a, other general needs is, you know, we're looking for um, donations of, um, bags like unused bags to be able to put additional food into so we've been working to receive donations from um, local groceries um, but as the need continues and as we um, you know continue to move through this those things will be needed so honestly it's it's the um, unconventional needs really that um, that would be helpful if somebody wanted to go and ask their local grocer 
for a donation of bags that they would then deliver to us that would help and alleviate some of the resources that we have um, just sort of seeking those things to make sure that we have the ability continue to continue to do the services um, safely. If people want to donate services or, or time, um, who do they need to get in contact with um, to do so? So for me, it would probably end up coming to me. Um, and I also want to say that on our website in particular um, and our Facebook page, we are putting um, out information in both English and Spanish. Um, so, and that's an important thing to say because um, that's certainly an, um, a, a community of people that we want to continue to reach out to and make sure that they have all of the information that we have, especially as the, the services or the times of things are changing or modifying ever so slightly. So if you are working, um, and we are working um, along with Isabel Taylor at Global Lex and Council Member Reynolds and some um, several others uh, to be able to make sure that the information that we are that we are uh, providing or hosting is being communicated out. So I would also encourage those resources to kind of go back to an earlier question um, to make sure that if you are working alongside people or families who are culturally and linguistically dis um, uh, I was gonna say different, that's not the right word. Diverse, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, that that the, the work that we are doing is able to kind of reach everyone that um, is in our service areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one thing I would just kind of echo a couple of the comments that Melissa just made. Um, I often think about it as a three-legged stool. There's funds, there's folks, and there's food. And right now, an individual, um, it, it would be best for them to donate funds, to offer themselves to volunteer, and to hold off on donating individual cans of food through a typical food drive. And the reason why I say that is um, because of social distancing, we really can't sort donated food that comes through a barrel or that comes through uh, someone dropping off some food out of their pantry here at the food bank. What we're doing with all of those donations is we're setting them aside. And once we are able to safely sort that food with volunteers at a later date, we will then sort that food and get it into the distribution stream. So right now for an individual, the best thing for them to do is to go online at godspantryfoodbank.org, click the donate button, they can securely donate online. We will take those funds and we will immediately turn that into food that we purchase or that we otherwise get gather and distribute so that we don't have to sort canned goods that come through a barrel. Uh, we need volunteers to staff our call center to help us with some of the curbside distributions that we're doing at the pantries. And we will need volunteers to do food sort at some later date when we're able to do that again safely and where social distancing isn't as critical as it is today. Um, so funds first, volunteering second. And if you need to, if you want to make a food donation, fine. Uh, just know that we will not be able to sort that right away. Mm -hmm. And they should go to um, your website um, yeah. to either donate funds or volunteer. Yeah. So for, folks, for folks that want to make a financial contribution or that want to volunteer, uh, go to our website, godspantryfoodbank.org, and there are pages for donations and there are pages to sign up for volunteering. Awesome. Um, a couple comments. Um, looks like Richard, um, yeah, <laughs> like we're talking about opening up for questions. Um, do you all need reusable grocery totes? Um, and then uh, Mark Davis wanted to know, or wanted to say, like, glad to get bags. How many do you need? So what we've been doing is kind of asking um, groceries for sort of a box of, of bags that they can then. So I'm happy to um, write a letter that if others want to go to their local um, grocery, that would allow them to kind of have the whole tax deductible element that's associated with that, just so that they have it for their records. I'm happy to do that. Um, you know, we have we have several cases of boxes or bags right now, but I know that as we continue, I mean, as as we mentioned, the number of families that we are seeing as an increase um, is making just things like that um, something that we you know we definitely need in order to be able to you know to be able to quickly and efficiently um, help provide food. So um, I'm I'm happy to to get Mark's information and maybe shoot him an email. Sure, that'd be great. To do that, that'd be great. Melissa, can I um, give you a bunch of reusable totes? Yeah, yeah, we'll take it. We have like just like plastic Kroger bags too. 
Yeah, I think we were, we've been asking for a donation just so that they would come, you know, just so that they're not coming from households and things like that, that maybe they're already boxed up and things um, just to make that a little bit easier and just to alleviate any, um, you know, concerns of COVID and that kind of thing. Um, but reusable totes might be good just to be able to help transport some, some of the donations or the foods when we go to our pop-up, that'd be great. Sure. Um, I do want to return back to Tom's question. Um, we've just got a couple minutes left. So well, if anyone wants to stay a little bit later and talk more about that or, or more about this, everything, um, you're welcome to. But just to get to this before we are um, technically finished, um, you know, what do you want to see included in any near-term additional stimulus funding? So you brought up a little bit about that, but if you, have, um, if you want to go more in depth on it, um, Melissa and Michael, um, then I'd love to hear it. So a couple of things that I would share. Um, first, we're very grateful and very thankful for what's already been done. Um, uh, one example, the payroll protection plan that is currently available. Uh, we have applied for one of those loans. And the reason why that's important for us is that it allows us to concentrate private donations on food rather than paying staff to handle food. So we're hopeful that we receive one of those loans uh, and we understand the process that we would then need to go through for that loan to be forgiven. Uh, what's really wonderful about that program for us is we're able to concentrate those funds on payroll so that we can use more private donations to buy and distribute food. Uh, the second thing that's really important is to continue to raise up SNAP, TFAP, which is the commodity, the uh, emergency food assistance program. Um, that's more food that gets into the hands of those who are food insecure, who are hungry. Uh, TFAP has gone up by 300 million already. I think there's going to be an opportunity for more. And uh, SNAP, while there are some waivers, there are still some restrictions that make it difficult for some people to get SNAP. So to the extent that we can all advocate with our congressional leaders on temporarily relaxing SNAP benefit um, ability uh, uh, to, to, to get the benefit, um, the better. The third thing I would add is FEMA. FEMA is, uh, handles disasters. Typically, it's a natural disaster. Uh, the Stafford Act does not actually allow FEMA to respond to a pandemic. Uh, it needs to be a disaster. There's some work going on right now to address that. Uh, to the extent that we can advocate for that type of resource to be available, it's that much more food that we can then access to help people who are impacted by a pandemic versus a, hur a hurricane or a tornado. So those are just a couple, three things that I would offer as opportunities when you speak with congressional leaders. Thanks. Melissa, were you going to say something? No, it's breaking oh. up a little bit for me, oh. so I'm trying to mm -hmm. figure out. I can you hear are. you pretty clearly. Okay. Or you're really clear, yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, if you didn't, if um, you didn't want to add anything there, I want to open it up to everyone else that's in the conversation. If you have any questions, it's four 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 oh one now, so we're getting to be a little bit over time. Um, but you're welcome to stay again, um, Melissa and Michael. If you have a little bit more time, um, it'd be great if you could stay. Just give us a few more minutes. Um, but yeah, if anybody has any questions or anything they wanted to add, um, I want to open it up now. Well, while folks, are, while folks are thinking about their question, um, I just want to take a minute to thank all of you. Yeah. Um, you know, you are community leaders who care. You are community leaders who can help get the word out to others. And to the extent that you've uh, gathered some information today, that helps you share with others how they can get help. Um, you know, that makes this call incredibly, incredibly valuable. Uh, there are so many people right now who have, who have not been hungry before, who are uncertain of what to do. And the extent that we can share information about resources, um, you know, we wanna help, we're going to help. We're here today, we're here tomorrow, we're here for the long haul. Um, you know, this isn't a sprint. It's not even a marathon, it's a triathlon. And we just started swimming. We still got the bike race and the run to go. Um, you all can help get the word out to give people confidence 
that the resources that they need will be there. And I greatly appreciate you all taking the time to be on this call today to help us share the, the information so that people can be a little less fearful about being without and a little bit more hopeful about being with. Yeah. And Laura, I would certainly echo that. And then I um, to, to return to the question um, that you asked a little bit before about what we would hope to do with stimulus funding. Um, so in addition to being able to try to use the resources to meet a, a, you know, emerging need um, with housing, we're also looking at job retention, um, jo you know, job employment, um, resources to be able to help people who um, are maybe going to um, go into a new field as a result of, of what's happening um, in our world right now. And so we're also looking at, um, uh, yeah, we're looking at ways to be able to leverage the resources that we will receive maybe through community services block grant funding um, and just and also with the part the the funding that we know that will be coming in our community, we want to make sure that we are uh, transparent in, in the work that we're going to be doing with it so that we can, um, again, leverage with other partners to be able to meet the greatest number of um, households that are in need. Um, and um, I believe that we're also going to be seeing um, a summer light heat program start. So the energy assistance program that I mentioned before um, uh, should have a summer component, which will, again, help with um, meeting summer costs, cooling costs, and being able to ensure that people can stay cool in the summer while, um, you know, in, in need of maybe not having the resources that they once had prior to COVID. So um, those are the com kind of the things that we're looking at being able to uh, develop quickly, um, good partnerships and good framework for being able to um, address those needs. But certainly, I thank everyone here for their partnership in general. I see, I recognize many of the names on um, the chat. And, um, you know, we're, we're here to help the community. And if there's a resource in particular that we didn't talk about today that someone is interested in, um, I'm happy to help get connected um, through, you know, to, to whoever is the best person to meet that need. Can I list Cheryl's sure. emails um, sort of in the follow-up to this? Please do. Yeah, that'd be great. I want to thank you both for being here. Um, thank you for your work and everything that you've shared today. And it's so important to as you were saying, like spread the word and connect as many people to the services that they might need as possible. Um, so we're happy to sort of be a bridge to that. Um, and if there's anything else you'd like to come on and talk about, um, we have these scheduled, you know, like ongoing. Mm -hmm. So we'd love to have you back and talk more. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to throw it over to Richard. He's going to talk about our next one that's going to be on Thursday. Um, that's going to be about more of like the economic um, help that's available for people. Um, so we'll, we'll just give you an idea of what's going to be going on then, Richard. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Megan. Um, <laughs> so uh, on Thursday at 3 p.m., um, we use every, do these every Tuesday and Thursday at 3 p.m. Um, we are going to be featuring some folks that are going to talk about um, how uh, organizations and businesses that haven't applied for PPP or EIDL um, can and what the best uh, approach to do that is. So the PPP is the uh, uh, aforementioned uh, Paycheck Protection Program. And EIDL is the Emergency Emergency Injury Disaster Loan. Uh, both of those are SBA programs that um, were either created or enhanced with the CARES Act. So um, a big thing that I think a lot of people don't know is that if you are a sole proprietor or if you are self-employed, um, you can now apply for both of those. Um, so those are really important things for I think a lot of folks to know. And we're gonna um, be talking with some experts on submitting that as well as some representatives uh, from a bank um, to talk about what that process is like and give people an idea of how long that sort of timeline is. Um, so uh, we're really excited to to be um, to be working with those folks on uh, on Thursday. So join us then. Um, at that, if there's if um, is there anyone else who wants to bring anything up, have any questions? I'm not seeing anyone uh, anything listed in the chat, um, you know, lately. But if you do but, have any extra, you know, any questions beyond this, I will put up um, contact info for Melissa and Michael so you can get in touch with them. Um, you can get in touch with us if you have anything you want to ask us about. Um, we'll see you again on Thursday. You can get that link at um, our Facebook page on the event um, and also our website. And at that, if there's nothing else, um, we'll say goodbye to everyone and thank you all for being here again. And if there's anything else um, you'd like to say before we leave, um, you're welcome to. We'd love to hear it.
I just want to take a moment again and say thanks to everybody. Meg, Megan, thank you for hosting today. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Really Bye. appreciate it. Uh, and and just to reinforce what Megan had to say, if, if anybody does have any questions, you are more than welcome to reach out to God's Pantry Food Bank. We are more than happy to, to answer any questions you all might have on ways that we can uh, continue to serve the community and on ways that uh, we can share information, whether it be through any of you or whether it be through other means to make sure that folks that are out there who need assistance get the assistance they need. Uh, these are unprecedented times. The task is daunting, uh, but if all of us work together uh, as well as we have worked together on this call today, uh, we will be able to tackle the task with, without too much difficulty. Thanks, Michael. Thank you all. Thank you all. All right. Have a good day. It was lovely to see you all. See you all. Be safe and be healthy. Yes, very much so.